Well, joined in studio, and what a pleasure it is to once again see our old friend, longtime friend of the show, one-time regular of the show, member of the BC Sports Hall of Fame, member of the Hockey Hall of Fame. Are there any Hall of Fames you still aspire to, Tony Gallagher? Well, no. It's <laughs> although Good to it see is, you, my man. It's kind of funny. Yeah, it's good to see you. I, I don't want to talk about halls and things like that, but it, it is good to be back, and uh it's amazing what you've done here with the studio. I've been here before, but it's uh, enduring. What a great location mm-hmm. you've got, and uh, it's so good to see. You guys are both still together and producing good material. Well, I appreciate that, Tony. Um, how's retirement treating you? How's Susan? How are the kids oh, it's and grandkids? Superb. Uh, you know, I, I have no complaints. In fact, I absolutely am celebrating my life, really. We've had 48 great years of marriage and uh, marriage can work believe me um even though through thick and thin i mean i had one of the toughest jobs to carry a marriage through because you you're working nights and you're working when the 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 news happens it was tough but i mean she was freaking trooper and uh obviously we have three children uh two of which are still here in vancouver one um uh, a lawyer in North Vancouver, very successful, just made partners, so we're very proud of him. But it's a, it's a tough life. Two grandchildren there, another guy who uh, works for the BC Cancer Agency. He's yet unmarried, and or whatever it is, what this week the Cancer Society mm-hmm. Agency, whatever they're calling it, it changes fairly routinely. He's doing imaging work for them because he's a, um, an engineer, hardware. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, engineer, and then I got an, uh, another lawyer in Ottawa. So I'm rather uh, over the uh, cap in in lawyers. So maybe I. It's a good. <laughs> it's good. It's good. <laughs> it's, well, I don't know. It's a good thing I've got somebody uh, that is deemed to be by society at least to be doing redeeming work. But mm. uh, it's funny, you know. Everyone tells all those uh, lawyer jokes, but the reality of, your, of a lawyer's life is they never even want to get a parking ticket. They're so pristine with their reputations that 90% of them are just like, I couldn't possibly do that. Yes. It, it might mm. be, you know. Oh, no one wants and to and get as a result, they've never had tickets yes. and never had even parking tickets. It's, it's really Preaching extraordinary. Preaching the choir over there, his yeah. wife and yeah. her entire family. Well, that's family. right. Yeah. You Surrounded know what it's like. Lawyers. I mean, yeah. really, they're so guardive of their reputations. Mm. They're not risking anything. So, so. do you, uh, in retirement now, do you, do you miss putting pen to paper or finger to keyboard? Do you miss uh, being creative in that way? Or do you, do you find different uh, outlets? You know what I miss? I miss being on with guys like you. That's what I miss. And I, you know, and Donnie and and Dolly. I guess I shouldn't mention the, the no, opposition. No, no. They're, they're but friends they're, of the show. Oh, yeah. though, that's yeah. good. I mean, and and all the guys I used to go on with Barry McDonald, especially. I mean, um, I just wish him all the best and pray for him on a regular basis. But um, those days are kind of gone. I don't miss writing much. No, uh, and yeah. no, not really. And you know, my. Uh, kids have got me doing this story worth thing. I don't know whether no, you've ever really. seen this, no. where uh, a person is asked every week to write something about their lives, about their history, about their family's history. So I've been writing that, and then they put it all together for a book, and I'll be able to criticize the book when it comes out <laughs> because <laughs> I'll have wanted to do the editing myself. But uh, no, that, I, I bet you that's why you don't. Cre- well, it's very instructive to not only the children who find out new things about my their grandparents yeah. and and the parents before them, if I remember it. But it's also great for the grandchildren mm-hmm. and the grandchildren to come who will be able to ch- trace their family history back and, and look at things of, as to where they came from and maybe understand more about their lives when, they give, when they're given the background of what their predecessors have been through. It's quite interesting. I hope you so. insert the odd like, metaphor and simile in, in in that storytelling of your life because we do miss that part of your oh, writing and uh, your fabulous uh, descriptions. Well, yeah, yeah, there were a few. I mean, but mind you, it was a bit like going over a corpse here, really. It wasn't for much of my career, you know. <laughs> when you think of the, of the run that I had here, I had like... 13 straight years under 500. I think that was a franchise record until mm. probably some of the NBA teams have beaten that by now. Um, but that was even realistic 500. This, yeah. this yes. what you're going through now, isn't even real 500. They're what, uh, seven or eight games under five under the Gary Bettman 500. Right. So uh, 
that's way, way below. So th this is a particularly gruesome year. But, um, you know, really, there were times when I was doing the Canucks, it was like a traveling funeral, as I used to describe it, because th they would stage the funeral in one city and then move along and stage the same funeral in the next. Well, and Matt and I have I, said went. this, we, we, like, lately, like, we just pray for it. And, this was something competitive, but this was the phrase that was going around. <laughs> Meaningful games in March was the phrase because yeah. people were so sick of that funeral that you're talking about yeah. happening well, in December hey, as so it happened. And now you've changed it to January. Yes. Meaningful well, games but, in January you know, to to continue on with this macabre. Yes, it is. <laughs> is a, we used to call it the Sorry death march. Yes. The death march. And, you know, now you know why Jake Milford called me the Undertaker. But I always, <laughs> I always like to correct that story. He really, I mean, this is even more abusive he called me the undertaker because of my complexion oh. i was so pale so mm -hmm. he says oh you look like an undertaker and then neil mccray picked it up and, and <laughs> that became my nickname but it went but neil used it wrongly but uh it was it was appropriate Can you roll your eyes back into your head and say rest in peace tony like the wrestler uh undertaker and we should also point out you know Criticism is a neutral word. It doesn't have to be negative. The analysis and judgment of the merits and faults of a literary or artistic piece of work. I'm sure your uh, uh, your book is going to turn out beautifully uh, oh, for those grandchildren, <laughs> Tom. For the grandchildren, yeah. I, I was tempted to write a hockey book, but mm -hmm. uh, it's like so many guys in uh, so many, uh, you know, people I've talked to, like Denny Podvan, for instance, would have a great book, or Bob Goodenow would have a great book. But if they sat and told the whole story, they'd be fighting lawsuits. They'd be um, having to check everything. It's just not worth it for what you'd make. And, mm -hmm. and, and you don't want to hurt people, you know, like bygones are bygones, you know. I don't want to talk about Brian Burke or any of these guys. I, I mean. So you're not writing a book. They're yeah. forgiven. No, yeah. no, I mean, yeah. you know, it's all water under the bridge. And mm -hmm. I'm not going to get my pound of flesh. I just think that's ridiculous. I mm -hmm. mean. Uh, what's past is past, and uh, you know I I Good always thing. liked Brian for the most part, and uh, and same with all the other alleged enemies I had. I mean I really didn't consider them enemies. You know what? I, it's funny. I, I've thought of you, and you mentioned uh, Neil McRae. I, I thought of you guys just recently as I thought about the current state of the Canucks and this sometimes adversarial relationship that. Um, you know, media has had with really the last couple of regimes for the Vancouver Canucks. And I thought of you guys in all the storms and 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 speed bumps that you guys had to weather. And I know you haven't kept up with it, but it, it did make me harken back to, you know, how how you were able to operate in, in, in those conditions. Well, you know, things have changed so much now. They have so much control, the hockey club does, whereas before I had the paper behind me. And the sun behind me, like, they weren't together, but the publisher kind of, when they went to the publisher to try and get me fired, which, to the best of my counts, happened <laughs> at least four times. There were four oh serious attempts to get me fired. Um, they would all kind of stand up and support me, and they, they, the club couldn't risk losing the paper because the paper was a big deal in those days. Right. The paper doesn't mean much at all now, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, that's that layer of protection that journalists were afforded has largely disappeared. Now you, based on and you, based on your reputations, have some protection, but you you earned it in an earlier era in many respects. If you guys were just new guys starting out. I think that that would be really tough. Like for all these guys doing the Botchford project and things like that, they have to mind their P's and Q's at every turn or else suddenly they won't be seeing a game ever again mm -hmm. or going into a dressing room ever again. Whereas I got sent all over the place by the paper. I got a chance to see these guys next to them on the plane when they flew commercial and they did many years in the dressing room and the hotel in the bar frequently after a few rockets. And that's where you picked up all your information and made the most annoying stories with respect to management. Now everything's controlled. Every interview is done with a mm -hmm. with a PR guy hanging over your back. So you Or know. by a PR guy, Tony. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, in some <laughs> cases. Yeah. And for those who you don't know, know, Brian Burke once said Tony Gallagher would complain 
about the color of the cars in the Stanley Cup parade, to which Tony said, well, let's see him win it first. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I would also boo a cure for cancer and many other things. There, there were lots of descriptions, but very colorful, and they were fun. Let yeah. me ask you about uh, more contemporary matters. Are they ever going to win with this ownership group? Like, Do you think this ownership group has what it takes to construct... Well, they have no a Stanley idea. Stanley Cup winning organization. I, I don't know. I mean, they came very close. Sure I mean, did. they were up three two in two eleven, mm-hmm. and they're you know they have two games of which they must win one. Now, granted, they were all banged up, but uh, you know, on paper, that's what it looked like. That's pretty close, but uh, so close as I don't. You can get, right? I don't game know seven. as you could say never because you don't know how long he's going to keep it, but. I don't think that uh, the ownership right now has the slightest idea of how to uh, hire management, uh, a management team. Like, I can't understand for the life of me why Jimmy Rutherford left his entire life in the East, his entire career, his playing career, his management career, all his success was all in the East. He comes out West, which in itself is a cultural shock. Like, the game start at 4 o'clock instead of 7 o'clock. That's a huge adjustment for these guys. Mike Gillis said it was the most pleasant thing that he really finally understood about living in Vancouver. And one of the reasons why he still lives in Victoria is because the games start at 4 and not 7 and they don't go till 1 o'clock. You can tape them and watch them in the morning, you know, which he could have done anyway. But, I mean, they had to be, when he was doing the job, he had to be right on top of everything. So uh, I don't understand why he left the East came out here and he did and it looks like based on some of the things he said recently that he's been somewhat vacant with respect to what's been going on and what's been going on has not been very pleasant to look at and I've looked at a lot of these teams over the years and this is close to one of the worst I mean they're all good players there anyone who makes the NHL is a good player but really the team chemistry does not seem to be there oh Tom they don't seem to play well together. They um, they have to get a B in their bonnet to actually go out and play a hard game, mm-hmm. and they're rare. Mm-hmm. Don't play the defensive side of the puck. Cheating oh, for offense. Don't no. support each other. Leadership the, group seems fractured. It's just and and hey. no one can fix the penalty kill. I mean, you could bring Helen Keller in here to do a better job on the penalty kill than that, but and she's not even alive as mm-hmm. we know. So. Uh, it's it's an awful struggle. I think it's one of the lower percentages in history. Is it it, 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 yeah. They are vying with the seventy nine eighty Kings, who of course oh. were a reasonably new franchise to yes, to um, I mean, not set the record for the lowest penalty kill percentage. I know they haven't had great goaltending. I mean, uh, Thatcher got off to a tough start at the beginning. Um, maybe it was the team in front of him. Maybe he was just due for a little dip in performance. Then he gets hurt. And then these two guys are just overwhelmed with the number of chances they're seeing. They've had the odd spurts of adequacy, but uh, that's about it. Well, here was the big question we were asking a couple of weeks back in the weekend where Bruce Boudreaux was unceremoniously fired and we had that the long goodbye two days. Oh, that was painful. So we were asking, and you're an authority, was that the lowest moment in Canucks history? Well, you know, my son asked me, maybe he was listening to you guys. Ah, <laughs> thank you, <My> Mark. Son, <laughs> he's in Ottawa. It was, oh, okay. was Ryan, actually. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. But uh, the funny part about it is I think there was a part similar to this back in 86, 87. Do you remember when Arthur Griffiths announced that he was going to find a hockey czar? I don't know whether you guys remember. A super remember boss yeah. was the term. A super boss yeah. czar. He used the term czar once and regretted it, changed it to Super Bowls. Yeah. So he approaches, I think he went to Sam Pollock, Scotty Bowman, Harry Sinden, a couple of others, and he's over. Tenured resume guys, yeah. They, they yeah. just say, get out of town, yeah. pal, you know. I don't know what he was offering with the money. I mean. Might have been the situation. Oh, yeah. Might have been the situation, looking at the roster, looking at moving west. Who knows what it was. So he hires Jack Gordon. Now, Jack Gordon was an assistant GM. He had no charisma whatsoever. 
And here's Arthur introducing Jack Gordon, who's been with the organization and suffered quietly and in the background of all this miserable time that preceded the seeking of the super boss. <clears throat> um, and he introduces Jack Gordon, and the market was absolutely crestfallen after expecting uh, Scotty Bowman or Sinden or, you know, I mean, they it had been documented throughout that these guys had turned them down, but expecting somebody, Emil, Fran, anybody, you know, and uh, somebody special, and, and here's Jack. And now, to his credit, Arthur went on. He, after introducing Gordon, he went on and quietly went underground, kept the search out of the media, and went and got Pat Quinn. They stole him from L.A. right with the the Quinn deal and that, yeah. but and then suitcase full of cash. If I'm not well, mistaken. yeah, that, that was <laughs> very helpful. Yeah, when the trainer brings a hundred thousand dollar check to you the, from the team you're coaching against that night, that was uh, all very fine. But uh, and then you're, I was surprised when he brought me the money, and the, in fact, mm. the contract obligated the, people, the team to pay within four, four When I was in days. Toronto, people said that changed Quinn fundamentally. Oh, that I did. Yeah. He had an incredible report, because as you know, Pat could regale. Pat was a hell of a yes. rock on tour. Pat could be a fantastic sort of Absolutely. people person. And that after that episode happened, there was a firm line between Pat and media, yeah. and he very rarely crossed on over and showed the sort of what? gregarious human side that we all actually got to know, uh, see again a lot later in life. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I, what happened was he was one of the nicest guys around. When he was in Philly, when he was in L.A., I mean, you couldn't ask to a more gregar ask to speak to a more gregarious, helpful uh, type of guy in a coaching situation. Fabulous. Well, and Tony and I had and a great rapport and Tony, with him. Uh, like uh, a lawyer called, called to the bar, like he was at. Well, he incredible. wasn't a lawyer. He never passed the bar. Okay, but yeah, uh, went to That's law school one of my and pet in, yeah, a highly <laughs> intelligent. Like you didn't have that sort of professional background with coaches and GMs and hockey. At the it time. was brand new. And here's the thing: when Quinn Gate broke, right and. Uh, he had taken this contract from the Canucks while coaching the L.A. Kings. Uh, there's a big investigation. The Stein investigation was, I mean, it's all ancient history, but it's tons of fun to go over it again because uh, it brings back a lot of big memories for me, big stories I had. And anyways, um, and well, Tom Larshad had too. Tom Larshad had the big scoop that the Canucks had landed Quinn, which was a, a, a real tour de force, but... Um, I had it the next morning, but he uh, scooped me, and he had it for sure. It was his story. And um, anyways, uh, the thing about it was that he gets the money from the Canucks, and, um, you know, it's all illegal. He's expelled from the NHL, and later he contests that, and there's much— to the Pavel Bure history here that... Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this this is unwritten stuff. But, I mean, the reason the Canucks got Bure has nothing to do with Larianoff. <laughs> nothing to do with that. That Larianoff goes over and he finds out he plays X number of games. They all submit this data, right? He and the, the, the guy from Winnipeg submit all this data about the new games they found Bure plays. Ziegler takes it and says... Well, that's fine. Yeah, that's yeah. He played more games, but I'm still not giving you bureau. But Quinn, being the lawyer that he was and a clever guy, he says uh, uh, he starts a lawsuit against the NHL for expelling him, and he was going to fight it somehow. And I, I guess the NHL didn't want anything. So Ziegler, nine months later, nine months after getting this data about all the extra games, which is the regular BS story that they tell about Pavel coming here. He reverses his decision and awards Bure to Vancouver. Now, that happened to coincide with the draft being in Vancouver that year, mm. and he would have to come and face 20,000 people at BC Place Stadium. That's right. And be at the podium and and be at introduced and we, th having, we think Batman I mean, gets booze. <laughs> there, there would have been 30,000 people right. at the at the stadium that day had he hey. come and they would have booed the crap out of me reverses decision and the rest of the league owners are furious 
Because they wanted a of shot course. at Bure. Everyone knew he was going to mm-hmm. be a superstar. But, uh, hey, you wonder how Gary runs the league? There's some DNA there. Politics, yes. PR, you perception, betcha. all of the other things. Can you that, imagine uh, that story Ziggler in today's well. media? Can you imagine, like, with all of the subterfuge and, and all? Like, I mean, it oh, would have yeah, been yeah. unbelievable. Well, yeah. It was largely a local issue. No yeah. one picked it up in the East. Or... So you ask him, you know why he doesn't miss writing anymore? Because when you cover the Wild West, mm-hmm. as he did, whatever we're covering these days just doesn't it was bizarre. just doesn't compare. I, I gotta tell you, yeah. it was it was a lot of fun. Marvelous seeing you again, my friend. Thank you for stopping by. Appreciate well, you, Tony. Always a great pleasure.